Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, uh, this time joined by Saman Darkan, uh, the co-founder and chief technology officer at Katopi. We're going to talk cloud kitchens and, um, you know, really more important, the technology behind it, because I know you guys are working uh, on precision. Um, and I always like to start by asking about the toughest problem that you're trying to solve right now. Um, welcome. And what is it? Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. The toughest problem we're trying to solve, the first thing that comes to mind right now is, uh, is scaling and expanding during this pandemic. Um, you know, we're, right now we just closed our Series C and we're, we're in growth mode, expanding to, to several other markets um, uh, in the MENA region. And we're actually looking at Southeast Asia. And, and that expansion has been challenging with the traveling dynamics happening as on and off. We literally just they took a step back recently. We said, where does everybody need to be? Because the because the travel situation was changing so dynamically. We just said, where does everyone need to be? And it's ready to be locked down there just so they can get things off the ground moving um, at speed. So let's talk about cloud kitchens in general first, because you can't assume everybody understands the concept, though all of us have been um, you know, gotten very well acquainted with the importance of good delivery uh, during this pandemic. Um, but there's this idea that you don't need necessarily a full sit-down restaurant in order to have good delivery out of it. And in fact, there might be some really good reasons not to have that. So how do you describe what it is that you're building uh, at Katopi and the, and the role that it's going to have? No, absolutely. So you know, it's the, uh, I, we call Katoke a managed cloud kitchen. And um, a cloud kitchen is a delivery intensive kitchen. So as you describe it, it's a kitchen that does not serve dine-in and it caters to the, to the demand that, you, that is generated online on, on uh, aggregators and marketplaces like Deliveroo and Talabat. And the biggest challenge there was that as that shift of demand occurred, when more demand was being generated uh, online, they needed to create a more efficient infrastructure that catered to it because um, uh, a lot of the dining locations out there that, that didn't really have that even split, uh, the, the split needed to have more kitchen space versus dining, they, they were creating a lot of economical challenges to managing under those sort of terms. So, so that's the pain point that we, we went out to, to address. And then what we do is we essentially license out and partner with these restaurants to launch them in these delivery only locations. And we provide much more than just the kitchen, we, we actually do the end to end operations. So our equipment is the supply chain, our infrastructure includes the kitchen and the uh, the people actually cooking the food on their behalf. So give me the, the scenario here um, on how this works. Like, because most of your uh, locations are, what is it? It's Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, what are the restaurant concepts that you're bringing in? Where are they coming from? Uh, how do you assess demand? And then how are you able to make sure that you know, the food, uh, everything looks and tastes exactly like the the restaurant owner, the IP creator wants it to. Yeah. So we, we, we cater to, to a very diverse range. We have international brands. We have brands like Papa Jones, IHOP, looking to expand more into the region, you know, joining our platform. We also have what we call local champions that, that are well known in, in the local territories that we operate in, but they, 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 they cover a certain segment of, uh, of the landscape. Um, so it's a wide range of those of, of those sort of brands. We're currently in four markets. We're, we're in the UAE, um, Kuwait, Bahrain, and uh, KSA. Um, uh, and, and when you join our platform, you can actually reach out and we can expand you across our network of kitchens in those locations. Okay. And um, when you're setting up a, a kitchen specifically for delivery and maybe um, – maybe even specifically for a certain concept, how is it different than setting up a restaurant kitchen? And are you delivering like all of the, are you delivering Papa John's and these other concepts out of the same locations, just sort of segmented out? How does that work? Yeah, so it's, it's it, our kitchen has been structured to be multi-brand. There's a lot of synergies when it comes to operating a wide range of, of brands within a single kitchen. And, um, and what we do is and those synergies include, you know, when it comes to delivery food, for example, you, you package delivery food, you interface with the driver, there's a dispatcher involved. Those are all shared services to a certain component. When it comes to the actual cooking, really depending on the brand mix, you know, some brands do have so, some segmentation, but there's always a component of synergy between certain brands that they do leverage. Some of that synergy actually sits in the supply chain, 
when, when it comes to leveraging the purchasing power of certain ingredients that are being used across multiple brands. Some of them actually sit in the in what we call the last mile satellite kitchen, where the equipments are being utilized by multiple brands. The same oven is being used across multiple brands, obviously being very mindful, mindful that those brands, uh, there's no cost contamination and that they could be used. Huh. Like, give me a sense then of um, how the layout might even be different. And are there elements of automation here? Because it reminds me of the difference between a retail store and an Amazon warehouse, just in terms of what you're able to do efficiency-wise and productivity-wise out of it. But then, you know, also your pace is going to be different and probably the, the skills uh, that you need out of your workers is different too. Hey, absolutely. So a, a big, our tech stack is a large um, component to why we're able to scale foods across it. Um, we call it SCOS, our smart kitchen operating system. It's essentially what powers up. We call it the G suite of the kitchen space. Um, it, it focuses on productivity when it comes to cloud kitchens. And, and when it comes to our kitchen layout, um, food behaves differently. So uh, if there's one thing that all our kitchens have in components is that we have a preparation, a packaging, and a dispatching area. Um, uh, and we cook based on sections. So you have a section that's a hot section and a cold section. But well, those sections are being used for multiple brands. So take a, bur a burger and a salad. The salad to be prepared in the cold section and the burger, you know, the, the grilled hot section. So our system automatically di um, distributes those items to where they need to be cooked. We have screens within each one of those sections, what we call KDSs, a kitchen display screen that tells the cook what they have to do and what they have to prepare. Some items just need to be bagged. They could take a... Uh, a Coke, for instance, you just take it out of the cooler and you put it right in a, in a bag right before it goes gets dispatched. So those items get distributed to where they, they need to be. We use a lot of other tech in the kitchen. Um, uh, we, we use, we, a lot of our tech revolves around driving efficiency and, uh, and uh, speed, ultimately to serve the consumer faster and quicker. So what we do is we sequence orders it, it automatically. Uh, for example, we know that a fry take two minutes and takes two minutes and burgers take six. So, you know, we start the fries at minute four, for example, to, so that they come out around the same time. If the driver, we predict when the driver is about to arrive so that we sequence the orders in the most efficient order to make sure they go out. And so there's a lot of machine learning and AI involved in that process. What, what about the workers themselves? Is it the same skill and demographic that you would get uh, in a restaurant and, you know, drivers in general in these geographies? Um, how do you think about the um, skill within the labor force, the cost of the labor force, the uh, you know kind of treatment of the labor force to grow this brand. Yeah, so I'd say it's, it's when you look at the QSR space, the quick service restaurants, it's at a skill that we are simplifying even further than that. Right, a lot of what we do is take the complexity outside of this operations, standardizing foods. It, there's a lot of what we do in terms of making sure that we cook in a consistent manner. Part of it is technologies that we built in house, and part of it is leveraging appliances and technology that's, that's out there. So for example, when it comes to a cook, we have a, a hub and spoke model when it comes to the food, food preparation. So uh, if you take the chicken skewer, for example, we actually have a much larger kitchen, one central in every city that does all the pre-preparation for that. That's where they butcher the meat, they marinate the sauce, um, and then they distribute it to these smaller kitchens where the peak, where the mass volume of our labor force works, and they do minimum preparation in those satellite kitchens. So when they actually receive the order, that skewer would have already been pre-prepared in the hub central kitchen. They would pay, take it out and place it into what we call a smart oven. And these are appliances that are out there that we, we use, but we, we leverage in a very different way. And they would just select the item that has already been pre-configured. They, they can automate based on cooking temperature and time and configuration. So they would select it and they would cook it automatically um, uh, at exact precision with very minimal preparation. It's very much an assembly work. Um, to to a, to a large degree. How transferable do you think your model is across different countries and geographic areas? Because there are you know different standards for food and nutrition uh, across different countries. You know, Europe uh, is known to have its own you know the EU very specific standards. For example, um, how how much is that part of your thinking as you think about this model? So when it comes to food safety and compliance, you know we're we're certified with the the the, uh, the standards, the high standards of uh, of health and hygiene. So we use ISO twenty two thousand, and in, in this in our region, like in the UAE, it's HACCP. Um, uh, so and, and those are very similar. 
um, to, in the markets that we operate. We always use the, the toughest standards that we are familiar with when it comes to enforcing those. When it comes to actually cooking and the procedure within the kitchen, we already have a very wide variety of dishes on our platform. And there's only so many ways you can cook a, you, you would cook differently in a different in a different market. So the kitchens are very much standardized. Now the equipments may be slightly different depending on the brand mix in any given restaurant. Some sections are more hot than, than cold, really depending on the, on the demographic that we're serving within that jurisdiction. But to a very large degree, our production model is standards. Um, and when it comes to safety, we comply with the best safety uh, standards uh, on the market. So given that, is your ambition global? I mean, software, software is eating the world, right? So, uh, and the world wants to eat. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, our vision is global. We are uh, a global company. We're first movers in the managed cloud kitchen space, actually taking on the, the challenge of cooking. And the way we see it, we're developing a production model that's going to be the ultimate distribution. We see this as a food publishing platform. And, and a lot of what we're trying to do is to streamline to the best ability. I mean, before it was pizzas and burgers was, was food delivery. And today you, you're getting gourmet meals delivered to you, hot, fresh, and, and consistent. And a big part of that is being able to, uh, to really standardize uh, and use the appliances and the technology that's out there that can enable cooking to, to be consistent. Isn't the packaging a lot of the challenge too, though? Because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm more of a fan probably of getting cheap food delivered than really expensive like gourmet food because the delta in in quality is less like if you're getting burgers then it's like okay i got this burger delivered and it's pretty good and if i sat down and ate it in the restaurant it would also be pretty good but if it's like uh more of a hundred two hundred dollar meal boy it's not usually nearly as good at least in the u.s when it gets delivered as it is sitting down in the restaurant and, and isn't part of that a packaging issue yeah, it, packaging is a, is a large component. I mean, with, you know, when it comes to even onboarding a brand that comes on, uh, that, that we, in the lead process, we're looking for brands that have thought about food delivery. That's a very important process because the packaging is important when it comes to making sure it's perforated and that the food travels well. You know, if it's not packaged correctly, um, it might actually be cooking on the way, right? So, so th those are measures that a, a good restaurant um, owner would have taken when it came to making sure that their food is, is delivery friendly to a certain extent. And beyond that, um, there's also how the food is cooked and, and what appliances they use. All those do play a role to ensure that it is food that can survive. All right. So now I want to uh, take a step back. We talked about the company a bit and we'll come back and, and talk some more, but I want to get to, to know you and understand how you got to the point where you're part of this founding team. Um, and I like to start at the very beginning. So, you know, tell me where were you born, uh, household, parents, siblings? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm uh, British, originally Iraqi. I was uh, born in London, um, uh, lived there till I was around 10, 96. We ended up moving. My family moved out to Dubai. Um, uh, I, I have one other sister, five years younger than me. Uh, we moved out to Dubai. My, uh, my father moved here for, for work reasons and uh, grew up here. Was here my whole life um, until college. Went out to California State University uh, in north of California, a town called Chico. Was there for college, studied information systems. And then uh, straight after graduation, came right back to Dubai. We're talking 2009 here. Wow. Yeah, now, I got to stop you there. That's a whole lot of very different place. I lived in California for a while. Um, I so I know about Chico, uh, and, and I know you know. I, but let's start in, in London. Um, that's quite a transition, I imagine, for a ten-year-old kid going from London to Dubai. Like I've briefly, I, I've spent more time in London than in Dubai, but it's it's different, right? What do you remember from that time? Oh yeah, so in, in London. You know, my, my parents raised me. In, we went to I went to a lot of private schools. You know, where you would, you would, you know, and and uh, even though my hair was partitioned in a certain way, you would. Uh, it was very formal, very sort of strict sort of schools. Um, when I came to Dubai, I actually had a very thick British accent. Right, it it, it went away over 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 the years. Um, pleasant memories. I was young. I mean, it, it was we're talking great. You know, it was up to grade four when I when I was in London, and I, I remember it being a, a, a wonderful place to to grow up. Um, uh, and um, Dubai, it, it, you know, it, as different as it is, um, uh, even my, my parents, well, being raised in London, my Arabic is pretty weak. 
when I came out to, to Dubai, that, that was never a problem. It was, it's, it's super westernized and, uh, and English is, is pretty much the mainstream common language out here. And so um, what do you remember about uh, Dubai at the time and maybe even the difference in school, um, the, the difference in mindset? There's so many uh, people coming in for work and families coming in uh, to participate in building and participating in that vibrant economy. What did, what did you experience? It's I mean, it's a very inspiring place to grow up in. '96 when we came out here, it was complete desert. It was all sand. It was it was uh, there was a lot of opportunity in the construction. And my, my father being a, a, he he has his architecture practice and he's an engineer, so that 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 profession was was really on the boom. And um, watching it, it's it's a city that changed so drastic, so quickly, so fast, um, year on year, and it was baffling. Even as a child growing up here at the age of uh, of ten. You would see year on year um, massive uh, um, landscape landmarks being developed. Uh, you know, uh, si pretty much cities within cities being developed to a certain to a certain degree, and that was always very inspiring. Um, uh, and, and being here straight after uh, uh, college, coming right back, um, um, it was exciting to see that that the, the degree of change every other year, um, not just in construction, but even in evolu evolution of the policy. And, and, uh, and, and the business. So in 2000 and I'll say 10, 11, that's when the startup industry really started to form in the, in the UAE. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be here just when it was starting. And when I see how far it's gone in, 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 those, in, in what has been a decade so far, it's, it's a very quick, very speed. Dubai is known for its uh, speed. Yeah, and I, from what I understood from my brief visit to the UAE, for its risk taking, you know, maybe versus Abu Dhabi, um, uh, also for for better, a lot of times, perhaps sometimes also for worse. But what did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, what did you see as the the possibilities, and how much was entrepreneurialism a part of that? So, in Dubai, it was. It was always business. I did want to get into business. My, my parents always tried to encourage me to go down there, sort of, you know, my, my dad wanted me to be an architect, an engineer, go down his, his footsteps. I never really, I didn't feel, uh, I didn't feel a, a strong draw to that profession in general. I did want business and I, I didn't have my eyes set on any sort of, sort of business plan at the time. And when I went out to, to California, right around then, um, I started as a business management major. I was actually in, in American University in Dubai for one semester, and I transferred over as a business management uh, major. And in there, I, I saw a, uh, a counselor in the, in the actual college who, who was giving us some career guidance. And it was there, I always had a love and passion towards, towards technology. Um, uh, and whether it was computer gaming or, or just you know, software programming, I always had to draw towards, towards computers and gadgets to, to an extent. But I had an equal draw towards business and management at the same time. And over there, uh, the, the profession of management information systems, which really felt like that thin line between business and, and, and technology, um, Chico State had a very strong reputation for it. They, they were one of the first colleges to be certified with the SAP uh, program, with the SAP Alliance program. And I was drawn towards that, that major and uh, learned everything about ERP systems and information systems. And that's really what set my sort of path towards technology. Subject-wise and hobby-wise, what specifically were you into, say, as a high school student that maybe built into the interest in technology and information systems? It was, it was definitely gaming. Um, uh, spent a lot of time in network, even this sort of social circle that, that exposes you to were those who were extremely into technology. Um, uh, I, I learned a lot about scripts, vulnerability exploits, understanding computers. Um, uh, um, uh, building small tools, productivity hacks, um, uh, but it was very much the gaming industry that drew me towards it. Um, uh, uh, it you know, today I'm not as not as much as a gamer as I was back in, in school, but it was my sort of first step in, in, into it. And then it just it just piece by piece sort of nurtured over over the years. Um, uh, information systems. I always had a love for for especially when I had an exposure. One of the things that drew me towards that major was the the need to drive efficiency. Into, into workplaces, um, uh, uh, paperless, finding, uh, finding a more effective means to get more things done within, 
less effort and time. And that's a, lot, a big part of what information systems is, is all about. I wonder if, though, that's not so different from architecture in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, architects think a lot about efficiency and design and structure. And uh, maybe you weren't going to be an architect like maybe your dad wanted, but it seems like you did have a sort of design and systems thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I got to, so right out of college, I worked at my dad's company for, uh, for what was supposed to be one year, but became six to seven, right? And um, for, How did that the, happen? I, I walked in there and, you know, it, it, was, it was 2009 and uh, the recession hit and my dad, you know, he, he was, uh, it was tough times in, in Dubai. So I went in there to help and I walked in there and it was like Disneyland because there was so many inefficiencies. Uh, there, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, the software they were using. There was a lot of opportunity irrespective of the department you were looking at, whether it was the HR management system or it was how they were um, uh, designing using AutoCADs and, and, and so on. So I spent a lot of time there really starting with the basics, the admins and the management and bringing in systems and tools to automate and to streamline that, get rid of a lot of the, of the, of the paper printing that was going on. But even when we went into the actual design process and architecture, there was a lot. It was I, I got exposed to what was uh, parametric design, computational design, which is really automating design layouts and floor plans. And uh, which, interestingly enough, is programming and and uh, design and architecture, where you would just input values and it would spit out uh, the, the most efficient design based on sort of standardized um, formulas that you put in place and, and bought it in. Tell me about the, the training and the experience in college that led you to that, because I, I know Chico is a place where if you want to get distracted, you can. Uh, apparently, you didn't get too distracted. I got distracted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got distracted. I'll say, I, you know, I, I actually went out to Chico. How, how did I even land there? Um, in, in Dubai, it's very popular. A lot of the um, a lot of the locals, our former minister of economy graduated from there, and it was very well, well known. In, in the city and at the time I just set my eyesight on leaving to to study in, in California and I had a friend that had graduated there and he had recommended it uh, as, as a university and I went there very social atmosphere a lot of people you know great great place to, to have some fun but when I got exposed to the program and in, in ERP in specific and SAP and so on um, I, I just fell in love with that major and it was uh, it was where I got my sort of start what was your um, first exposure to entrepreneurial business, either um, in Dubai or even in the U.S., where any of your classmates or friends uh, starting things or involved in things that uh, you know businesses other people had started? So it, 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 during college, I, there wasn't much exposure. When I think of it, I mean, it was um, it was all about the academics and. Uh, and even at that time, you know, even food delivery was infancy, non-existent to a certain extent, right? Um, uh, my first entrepreneurial exposure was back in Dubai when I when I flew right back right after, you know, joined my family business, um, uh, and in, in 2010, 2011, that's really when when things started shaping over here. You, you had our first sort of incubation programs popping up, first co-working spaces. Um, uh, there was even these entrepreneurial sort of cafes that were opening up that was just drawing the sort of crowd that was that was um, very creative, very creative. And in that atmosphere, that's where it, it was really cultivated. Um, I went through several startups before before Kitopi, um, most of which failed. Um, some saw some success, and uh, that journey and at that stage in 2010, even the venture capitalists were were startups, uh, <laughs> and, and they were they were trying to figure out the right you know the right investment model that would work with. With, um, with sort of seed stage um, uh, startups. And that's where I had my first exposure. Um, and uh, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of reading involved uh, and uh, a lot of inspiration of what you see, you know, it, with, with some of the larger companies that we, you know, Google and so on, reading their stories. Well, why did the, why did the startups fail? Um, it, you learn from failure, it's not always a bad thing, but in, in those cases, what was it? Was it, pulling the plug too soon on an idea that could have played out? Was it, you know, an idea that maybe it wasn't the right time for? Yeah, it was uh, several of those reasons. Each one taught me a very powerful lesson. Um, if I was to summarize them all into one, first of all, solving a, pro a problem worth solving, really going after it, understanding it. I think quite often a person's passion gets in the way of, 
of what they're what, what they're looking to to serve, the need they're actually trying to address. My first startup was called My Metro Talk. It was one of the first companies to be accepted into an incubation program in in Dubai. And wh what was that? That that was it. what we was doing was uh, helping people decide and find things to do based on their mood and situation. So it was really catering to boredom to a certain extent, finding an, an, an indecisiveness of finding a place to go. Um, uh, spent a lot of time on that, worked on it. You know, funny enough that I actually at that time um, uh, I was attending a lot of of, of seminars and and uh, uh, workshops. And one of the lessons I got was, it, it, you know, it's hard to find the hunger when you're so well fed. And the, and the insinuation <laughs> was that that if you're in your comfort zone, you're not going to be able to sort of do it. At that time, you know. I, I did something that I, I think is kind of silly now, and I look back at it. But I, I sold my car, right? At, at that point, right? I sold it. It was a, it was a gift from my parents at the time. I was like, I'm too comfortable, and I, I got to get out of the woods and, and really find that uh, that urge to be more creative with being more resourceful with with, with what I'm building. Um, uh, was it, that that startup failed? At, at some point, I realized I wasn't even using it, and that's where it was a, a, a big wake up call. After that, oh, oh, uh, led to a, a tool called Central Tickets, which was in the event space. It's like Eventbrite, but localized. To the region that one had traction so I, I managed to get about 400 organizers on it it was a, it was a tool to enable these organizers to really build events sell tickets transact online and so on and that was doing pretty well um but i, I went through it, that was a timing issue because at that time the regulate the regulative uh, um infrastructure the policies didn't really enable it to to thrive i went through some challenges there classifications of what an event was tax reasons and so on and at that point, I decided to sell it to, to one of the organizers on the platform. It wasn't a massive success, but it wasn't a massive failure either. Um, uh, and then one, one led to, to another, um, which was called Little Bedu, pretty random e-commerce, baby apparel space. Um, that was so, I was actually in the middle of that. I was with, with two other partners who, who very much led the way to its success to today. It continues to grow before Kitopi uh, came into the picture. Um, and then Kitopi came into the picture. You've been uh, doing things in a lot of different areas, you know, events, um, I guess, diversions, events, clothing, and then food. Uh, how? Yeah, so um, uh, the CEO, my partner, Mohamed Alut, Mo, he, uh, um, um, I've known him since, since high school. Um, um, actually, the founding team, we've all known each other for, for quite some time. Uh, both Feder and Mohamed were in the same school that I grew up in. Um, in in, in uh, the UAE, so y'all went uh, to the same y'all went to the same high school. Oh yeah, yeah, we all went to the same high school. Um, it's actually a school in Sharjah, part of the UAE called the Shreifat. We were all there. Better actually lived in the same. Better our, our chief growth officer. He lived in the same building um, that I did, and uh, so we knew each other very well. Um, and like, what context did you know each other in? Um, were you participating in activities together? Were how did you know each other? So Bedir, I knew as neighbors in school. He was actually one grade below us in in in, that, in high school. So I knew him very well as a neighbor. Would hang out. You know, he sat in the penthouse upstairs, and uh, we would hang out as kids being kids, play football in the area, hang out in his place. He'll come over, so on. So we knew each other as friends in that in that sense. Mohammed, the CEO, I knew him in in school. Um, uh, we were in the same class. We didn't know each other that well. Back in, in, in school, we, we mixed with different crowds, but we, we did know, know of each other. And, and Andy and Mohammed, our, um, our fourth co-founder, they went to uh, the university together. Okay. And so uh, how do you end up coming all back together for Katopi? So after college, me and Mohammed, um, I mean, we, we were always, we stayed in touch. We have a, a lot of uh, sort of uh, mixed, mixed friends, mixed crowds. And right after school, we, we kept in touch, came, came back in 2009. We started hanging out again with the same sort of circles. And um, he, he was on his own journey. He, he finished, uh, he, he, he built a B&B group with his brother and his cousin. Um, uh, it's a confectionery business that he launched uh, over, over a decade. And, and um, at that same time, while he was doing that, I, I was working on these startups. Um, so we would always, I would always tell him about my experiences. He would know what I was doing. He would always be curious. Um, uh, he, he, he would, I remember he went through Endeavor, which is a, a, a massive sort of a, a high on impact entrepreneurship program that he joined at that same time. And I was interested in it. So we, we always had a lot of common interests in the entrepreneurial sort of journey and sector. Um, uh, so I, right after uh, he exited BNB Group, and that was a very large successful exit for him, uh, he became 
pretty much an investor to a certain extent. He, he went into semi-retirement mode, looking for a, a, you know exciting investments to invest in. Um, uh, and right around then, I was on my on what was my fourth startup at, at that time, and we were talking about he was. Uh, he, he would always pitch new ideas continuously. We went on a trip together. We were, we were hanging out and he would always pitch a new idea continuously. And I would usually, you know, I think he saw me as a paper shredder to a certain extent. He would come and I'll, you know, we'll bounce <laughs> off it. I'll create him. No, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him, I, I know what won't work. You know, I'm still trying to figure out what will, but that won't work. And that's why we always had really cool, engaging, exciting discussions when, when kind of brainstorming a business model and a problem. And, um, Right after he exited, he was looking to invest. He, he was pulled into the restaurant sector. He was looking to invest in restaurants. He had a passion towards food. And um, he, some of the restaurants he was looking to invest in, he saw a common pattern, right? They were, the, the food delivery uh, sector was growing. There was a demand and delivery of those growing. And it was actually causing a pain point for some of these restaurants that were, that were already operating. These are restaurants that, had, that were sitting in prime real estate, they had large dining areas and they saw the shift in demand. And when he was zooming into those economics, when he was looking to invest in them, um, he saw the margins they were paying to these aggregators um, uh, to cover the delivery costs and how it didn't make sense um, uh, with their current infrastructure. So at that time, he, he, you know, the, the shared kitchen model, just the cloud kitchen, was getting some traction in the West. Now, that, that model has been around in, in, in China for, for so much longer. And, uh, but that didn't quite solve the pain point. Because those models, it's a shared kitchen play. What they do is they take a warehouse, they fit it out as kitchens, they split it up, and they lease it as a more cost-effective means of expansion because it's lower rent. Um, uh, now, here he drew a parallel, and this was a, a really special part, because he drew a parallel between his confectionery business and, and the food industry. He said, if everyone's going to cloud kitchens today, and you know they call them dark kitchens and ghost kitchens, but they, they essentially mean the same thing. He's like, they're going to ghost, ghost kitchens. He goes, there is a bigger opportunity to consolidate there and to leverage more efficiency. You see, if you and I were, were going to create a chocolate brand, we weren't going to go build a chocolate factory. We were going to go leverage the economies of scale of, a, of a, someone that has a production house um, to do it for us. And we were going to handle the distribution and, and work on the merchandising and so on. So he, he saw why can't that be done, that consolidation be done in, in the cloud kitchen space where we can leverage the same ingredients and have strong purchasing power where the same cook can cook for multiple brands. Um, uh, and leverage it based on the uh, the demand utilization of that segment. So he floated that idea by me at the time. I mean, it went through several uh, variations, but it was it was such an exciting one. And we saw. Did you shred it at first, though? You know, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I, I my first reaction. There was so many unanswered questions, right? There were there was the questions of of um, you know, will people license? Will, will people share their recipes over with us? You know, it's it's uh, grandma's secret sauce. I'm going to hand it over to you. It, it, it makes me feel. I was a bit apprehensive with that at, at first. There was the question of can I cook, cook across such a large spectrum of dishes and a wide variety of cuisines? Can you, can you create um, a food consistency? And, you know, he had the same questions, right? But we both had the same level of, of conviction that if we were able to crack this, um, uh, that would be the start of, 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 a, of a very exciting um, uh, value proposition. What and, convinced um, you? What convinced you that enough of those problems were solvable so the same restaurants that he was looking to invest in we were, we came back from that trip with a desire to look into this we said let's look into it right it's it's an exciting uh, opportunity and we we and it was this notion of of democratizing this infrastructure for any restaurant to access so we went straight to the restaurants to go speak with them he was looking to invest in a lot of them i remember he was speaking to a lot of them he's like you know good news and bad news you know bad news is i'm not investing in anyone <laughs> he's like but the good news is that i'm going to build the infrastructure for you all right and um, all I want you to do is focus on your marketing, focus on, on building a good product that consumers want, the right recipes. A lot of them were chefs and they understood it. Some of them were existing businesses that, that were covering part of the town. And, and we will launch you across this infrastructure and we will do it at the right, uh, at the right um, uh, to make sure that you, you, you get enough out of this, you know, in, in terms of what we call a royalty fee, a license fee, for this to be worthwhile for you. And you can see right there, they, they, you know, there was a question of, will they buy it, right? And they did. They, they were quickly relieved because there was a lot of CapEx. And you know, it's, a, it's not the CapEx that's just the pain point. It's the OpEx. The, the challenge with scaling restaurants today is building the team. It's, it's building a supply chain. It's training the cooks. That's where the pain point is. It's, that's the reason why so many great restaurants take so much time to grow. And, and a lot of great recipes don't, don't, 
get to be where they're, they're, they're most demanded. So, so that was the first sort of eye opener to see like, was there a need? And that, going back to my initial point, you know, was there a need for this? And putting all the complexities aside of whether we can really crack this or not, there was a question of was there a demand of people giving us those recipes and doing it? And those were the first ones. But the first one, the one that gave us the, 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 the one that gave us all the more confidence that we, we, we went um, uh, much harder in was once we got the first sort of restaurant that already had a, a, a presence jump on board. Um, uh, that was a really exciting uh, sort of milestone. Who was that? What, what was the restaurant? That was called Ripe Bites. Um, uh, they, they were the, the first one. And they have a really, they're one of the very popular health plans, uh, uh, healthy plans, uh, it, it, healthy food plans in, in the UAE. They have a meal plan subscription service and they have an on demand, what they call Ripe Bite Express. And uh, she was working with us very closely. And I was, we were, you know, and there was a question on could we get her to access our kitchens? And we did. Um, uh, and that was the first sort of massive milestone. Um, since then, you talked about scaling being a challenge. I imagine there are all sorts of, you know, micro challenges that are part of that from, you know, sourcing the real estate in the right areas that, you know, are you obviously don't want um, big rents, but you want central location. So a lot of times cloud kitchens, ghost kitchens are located in industrial areas. But uh, from sourcing the locations to finding the workers in what are often tight labor markets these days, how is that playing out now, uh, now that we know more about the business and the challenges? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a very good observation. You need, to, you, know, you need to be in a prime location so that you can serve at speed. Um, uh, to the audiences uh, that live close by. Um, but for us, when we say non-prime real estate, I mean, it could be in a prime location, but it's not prime real estate in the sense that it could be in a basement, it could be on the side, it could be in the back. Um, so we, you have that sort of elasticity. But the most biggest challenge, and it's something we always work towards, and today we work really hard when it comes to the actual product that we're serving, servicing, is making sure the drivers can access those locations in a way that's non-intrusive and that is not turbulent to, to, the, to the community. So, so we spend a lot of time really analyzing the accessibility of those sites, making sure that drivers can come in and out at speed um, uh, in a way that's, uh, that's, uh, that does, is discreet and is respectful of, of the, the people that live uh, close by. And we, we work a lot, and there's a lot of tech that we built to really minimize their waiting time, to ensure that the moment they show up at our kitchen's doorstep, that they, they, they grab what they need and they, they walk out the door as fast as possible. I've got a lot of questions, maybe hunches, theories about whether this cloud kitchen concept is the end game for a whole lot of different types of businesses. Look at DoorDash, you know, Tony Shu over there, I think is kind of known to be investing in cloud kitchens, ghost kitchens. Um, you know, the, the guy who started Uber, Travis Kalanick is, is also uh, kind of dabbling in the area. If you're gonna make that model, that delivery model work, it sure helps if you are doing exactly what you're doing, which is making the back and the whole supply chain of it more efficient. Do you think this is just going to be a strategic um, imperative for the delivery industry eventually? I think it's a, it's a, yeah, it is an imperative. It is a necessity, and I think there's a, it's a there's a lot of change coming. I mean, and I think the the cloud kitchen is is part of that solution. Um, uh, the, the demand for food is is growing for for delivery. And there had to be an evolution. And, and, and you can see today, even the food delivery is still a very small part of the, of the overall food service hospitality sector. So there's a lot of infrastructure needed to ensure that we can cater to, to, to people who just want their food home um, at, at speed. But I think the cloud kitchen model is, is far beyond that, just that food delivery at speed. It's actually evolving uh, the, the food offering and the variety that consumers are getting access to. Because the moment that you were able to consolidate them into a single location, that opened up a whole um, a, a lot more opportunities with what you can do with that with that variety. For example, you know you, you can mix and match between all the the items within those restaurants. You can have your appetizers for brand A and your main course from another, or you can be two people just wanting completely two different dishes, but to have them serve um, uh, within one driver at the same time. So those were just the, the sort of first surfaces that are being scratched with what that offering can mean to the end consumer. Huh. Um so I, I want to get a sense, uh, we've been talking about challenges. I like to ask about what I call Death Valley, and you spent some time in California, so you probably know what that's about. But lowest point 
Um, there's often so much learning there. What's been the most difficult period in your career or your learning um, where you thought the goal that you had, uh, the, the track that you were on, maybe it just wasn't going to work out and you had to completely rethink? Oh, yeah, that, that would be the first three months without question. So, you know, as you pointed out a little, a little earlier, none of us were in the food service sector in the very beginning. And ignor ignorance is bliss to a certain extent, right? We, we came in there and, and a lot of people we were speaking with, a lot of chefs were telling us, you, you won't be able to create sort of consistency with the food uh, and the food quality. So when we came in, you know, the first brands that we came on board, how do we control food consistency? We were cooking it. We were all standing there watching it. It was not scalable. And then there was a moment where um, we ended up working very closely, closely with some of the appliance uh, smart, the smart oven appliance manufacturers that we would work with, the suppliers. And we were spending a lot of time in those kitchens, really uh, uh, engineering foods and understanding everything from, you know, how you cook it, how can you standardize it, the ingredients being used, the cooking technique, um, when to sous vide and when not to, and really understanding the, the, how food can be really engineered or food consistency within the, within the kitchen. And we spent a lot of time cracking it. And, and, and you know, in the very beginning, the first two, three kitchens, we had a lot of inefficiency in, the, in those kitchens. And uh, there, there were questions on, on what sort of volume can we do within the, the smallest amount of square footage um, to make this economical. And, uh, and there were a lot of hurdles with that, part, partially to do with the appliances we were using to ensure that we cook in a timely manner consistently, partially used with the systems. And this is where really Scoffs played a, a big role. In the very first year, John, when we started, we had no intention. We, we didn't start to totally build tech. Right, the first year we just did what most people would do. We just took technology that was off the shelf, right, to, to use it, and we almost crashed and burned doing that. Mm. Um, it was a, a massive challenge. None of them were tailored for this multi-brand usage. Um, uh, all the tech stack out there, the restaurant management systems, the POS systems, and so on, they were catered for for dining management for the most part. That was their pioneering software for good reason too. But when it came to food delivery and, you know, the aggregators that you integrate with for the order processing or the drivers that you integrate with to for, the, for that or the packaging within, there was very little thought with those workflows. And, and um, we ended up having to use, we had to hack the usage of systems that were off the shelf. And uh, there was a question of whether, because there was such a strong demand for our service at the same time. And we were getting real volume, but we were having a hard time really producing in the actual kitchen. So that was what was the death valley at least in the first year of the model. It wasn't until 2019 that we actually started tailoring our own system and our own solution. Huh. It, what was the breakthrough that led you to that solution and sort of out of that vice of a high demand and inability to supply? So the, the breakthrough that led to it, um, uh, I, I'd say, uh, so the, I, I can tell you the moment where we, we, we did, made the decision to, to sort of build it out, right? Okay. It was, I was, I, was, I was sitting at, uh, you know, Steve Wozniak was here doing a seminar and I just got out. I was sitting there watching, watching it present. And I remember getting a call, you know, out of the kitchen. At that time, we were in and out the kitchen, you know, at, at, at any minute. And, um, and all our, you know, the whole software sort of broke down. Um, uh, everything froze. At the time, we, we were doing a lot of clever hacks, like, you know, each brand, each restaurant was its own individual browser. So, like, Chrome was one restaurant and Mozilla was another and Internet Explorer. Imagine 22 browsers that were being launched across all that, all of that. And, um, and it was over flooding and it was, it, it completely broke down. So right there at that moment, we said we need to build, build something. We managed to, to, to get past those, those months as we, we grew um, uh, at a small scale by, by getting those providers to really tailor the basic necessities needed for us to sort of keep our heads above water. Um, uh, but then at that point, we, we, we decided we're gonna build something out of, of our own. Um. How did you know you could build something of your own? I mean, I, I imagine part of the reason why you're holding back from that is because not only is it a big financial commitment and resource uh, commitment, but um, boy, it's hard. So we were, we were fortunate enough to to get investors. You know, first year we we raised close to thirty million dollars, right? So year two we we raised uh, sixty, and then in that first year, so we did have the capital um, infusion that we needed, and. Um, at that point, we, we decided uh, if we're going to build this, we're going to build this right now. I had already built several solutions in the past and, and had my fair share of exposure of, of software gone wrong, gone, gone wrong, so, so to speak. And I didn't want to underestimate the complexity involved. I did feel that we did have the know-how and the understanding. That first year was an incredible learning experience for us. We, we got to understand truly what we needed. You know, had we 
build something from the ground up um, uh, prior to launching, we would have simply built the wrong thing. Um, uh, a lot of the pain points that we built for are really tailored to our needs. You know, even the assembly process is, is such a unique problem because we, we, we package such a high volume of orders at the same time where you need to scan and make sure that you sort them um, within a timely manner. And those were problems that we exposed, we were exposed to because we were trying to sort them in a very manual manner within a much smaller volume, but it felt like the kitchen was shaking and, and breaking down. So, so those were exposures that gave us the confidence that we knew what we needed. And that was the most important part that we actually knew what we needed to build. When it came to the actual tech stack, I was very conscious that I didn't, um, that I wanted to build the best team, the best talent. Um, uh, and uh, I, I went out to, uh, to Poland to find a phenomenal VP of, of engineering to partner with. Um, uh, my coding is very rusty uh, and, and I needed someone to fill that void. Um, uh, and I went out there, uh, why, why Poland, some of the best talent in the world, some of the best engineers, you know, Google has an R&D center, IBM, Samsung, Intel. Um, uh, and I went out there and, uh, and partnered with someone and we ended up sort of building out our team and it became our engineering tech hub um, out of a town called Krakow in Poland. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know Krakow. So um, very often I find whatever it is that brings an entrepreneur through Death Valley, whatever lesson becomes like a core belief that you keep using. So I, I'm getting the sense that you were alluding to a few of them there, but what would you say was the main thing that you learned that you continue to use that you got from that situation? But from the situation, um, and it, when you say the situation, clarify. I mean, from the, that really tough first three months, year of, you know, the system not working, figuring out that you needed to build your own and then and then doing it. Is there a core belief or um, a learning that you have about entrepreneurship or the business itself that continues to inform you? Yeah, so the approach I always take is I look at the problem, irrespective of how complex it may seem. And I, I know sometimes even, even the site of our kitchen at that time, it was an overwhelming sense of complexity. Just when you look at all the missing pieces. I should remember vividly a conversation I was having with my partner at the, at the time. And he, he was, uh, we, our kitchen was doing roughly, you know, 100 orders a day. And you can see the staff and, and the process was so inefficient that, that uh, the, there was um, a, a lot of struggle with just trying to produce the orders and a lot of chaos and mayhem and so on. And, uh, and you know, he said, we're going to do a thousand orders a day out of this kitchen. Today we do close to 2,500 to 3,000 orders out of that same kitchen. I can, I can conceive how we were going to do 200 at the time I was looking at it. But when you look at the problem, we ended up breaking it down. Really, when you break down a problem, irrespective of how complex it does, and, and you start bringing them to all these smaller problems and bite-sized problems, as I like to speak, you can actually paint a, a clear picture of how you're going to solve each one of them and how they tie in to, to unlock some of the major issues that we, we were experiencing at the time. So, so that, that, that conviction, when I looked at each problem in isolation, bit by bit, we put them through and understanding how we were going to solve them and drawing out that, that, that roadmap. And as we started to solve them, that was only motivating to the, to the aspect that we can solve the next big challenge. Um, uh, that was the, what gave us the, the conviction that we can uh, get it done. And so now as you uh, look at expanding into Southeast Asia, I believe, uh, you said, what's what's the vision for how you're going to do that, both on the logistical side and then engaging with the right restaurant partners to make it happen? So it's similar to uh, our playbook consists of, first of all, when we go to a new market, it's about building partnerships with the aggregators of presence, right? We have a, we have a strong relationship with, with every aggregator that we work with, um, uh, Delivery Hero being a major one, Deliveroo and so on. Um, uh, we, you know, many of these aggregators, we actually build products side by side with too. It's really strengthened that relationship. You know, for them, we're trying to solve their driver efficiency. One of the biggest benefits of, of working with company uh, with a company like Kitopi is that we we pump out a lot of volume out of a single location, and and the the, the logistics component is one of the highest cost components of of an aggregator, um, and they really try to u utilize the driver as efficiently as possible when it comes to turnaround. And there's a big synergy of doing so. With, with Kitopi. So part of that is sequencing the orders correctly to ensure that they get that sort of synergy and, and working closely with that. So a big part of when we go to a new market is ensuring that we have that stri strong relationship. Second is making sure we have the right restaurant portfolio. Very important. Um, uh, it, there's a lot of, you know, the brands follow where when we open up a new market, we have a, a great portfolio of brands with us and it's ensuring that we have the right mix for that sector. But most importantly, it's also about having the right restaurant partners in the 
uh, in the country itself as well that have local recognition on our own and that needs help expanding. Huh. Well, um, that, that makes a lot of sense and I look forward to seeing exactly how you're going to grow that and, you know, software translates. So uh, I see your ambition sort of moving across the globe the way you yourself have uh, from London to Dubai to California uh, back again. Sam, it's been great. Thanks for sharing your vision and Katopi's uh, with me on Fort Knox. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me.